everyone, and today we are going to continue our book club with the textbook of Fundamentals of uh, Radiology. Uh, this uh, chapter, uh, the chapter about uh, head and neck imaging, was originally presented by our colleague, Dr. By our colleague, Dr. Sabah Ghafoor, our resident. However, unfortunately, due to some technical difficulties, it was not recorded properly. So I decided to repeat the uh, whole presentation uh, in order for you to see it. So regarding head and neck imaging. Head and neck is a term used collectively to describe extracranial structures, including the sinonasal cavity, skull base, pharynx, oral cavity, larynx, neck, orbit, and temporal bones. The, myth, the imaging methods used are CT, MRI, PET scan. And the PET scan offers a, a very uh, a benefit, is, is a very beneficial modality to uh, image head and neck, uh, especially in cases of malignancy, because it uh, detects uh, the uh, Radio, the glucose analog, radioisotope, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose. Uh, this uh, this uh, radioisotope uh, gets concentrated in the uh, areas where there is increased metabolic activity, that is malignant uh, lesions. So uh, we can measure it and by using something called standardized uptake value, SUV. Uh, by measuring the SUV, we can decide whether this lesion is a benign or malignant. Uh, in general, SUV value that is greater than 3 is considered pathologic and suggestive of malignant involvement, uh, but uh, there are a variety of non-malignant conditions may give rise to an elevated SUV, especially infection and postoperative changes. Additionally, some tumors have a poor glucose affinity, resulting in a low SUV. So, it is most useful when it's combined with CT or MRI findings. First, we will start with the paranasal sinuses and the nasal cavity. Uh, the most common uh, pathologic entity of the sinuses are sinusitis. Uh, it uh, usually shows as a mild mucosal thickening, most commonly in the maxillary and ethmoid sinuses, uh, even in asymptomatic individuals. Acute sinusitis is characterized by a presence of air fluid levels or foamy appearing sinus secretions, and it's typically caused by a viral upper respiratory tract infection. While chronic sinusitis, there are other changes, including mucoperiosteal thickening as well as osseous thickening of the sinus wall. Major area of mucociliary drainage is the middle meatus, also known as the, as the osteomyetal uh, complex or osteomyetal unit. It's important to note that the disease is limited to the infundibulum of the maxillary osteum will result in isolated obstruction of the maxillary sinus. While if the lesion is located in the hiatus semilunaris, that's the middle meatus, this will result in combined obstruction of the epsilateral maxillary sinus, anterior and middle ethmoid air cells, and the epsilateral frontal sinus. So if it is in the osteomyetal complex itself, there will be multiple sinuses, while if it is only in the uh, maxillary osteum, will result in isolated involvement of the maxillary sinus. As you can see here, this is a case of uh, sinusitis. Sorry, as you can see here, there is uh, this is a case of sinusitis showing uh, mucosal uh, involvement of the ethmoid air cells, and it extends intracranially into this part of the brain, and there is also associated involvement of the uh, uh, orbit in this case. So the complications of sinusitis includes inflammatory polyp formation, which uh, as a result of chronic inflammation, it will lead to mucosal hyperplasia and resulting in polyp formation. Uh, there is an entity called entrocoanal polyp. When the entral polyp extends in, uh, to the point where it prolapses into the sinus ostium, uh, this is known as entrocoanal polyp. Uh, they may not be associated with the chronic sinusitis and it's characteristically appear as a soft tissue mass extending from the maxillary sinus to fill the ipsilateral nasal cavity and nasopharynx. The ostium of the maxillary sinus will be enlarged due to the polyp extending through it. Uh, and uh, here you sh we should note that uh, radiology is uh, very important since uh, removal of the uh, nasal part of the polyp will almost always result in recurrence of the polyp. 
other complications include mucus retentions, cysts, which are characteristically rounded appearance, measure up to several centimeter in diameter, uh, the maxillary sinus being most commonly involved, and uh, they are different from mucosil. Mucosil, it's in uh, pathology, it's similar to retention cyst, but in the state of the disease being confined to a single mucus gland, the lesion expands to the point where the entire sinus become obstructed. This is uh, more um, uh, damaging to the sinus. So it will result in expansion of the sinus associated wall bony thinning and remodeling, and it's common, most commonly affect the frontal sinus. If infected, there will be peripheral enhancement, and here it's termed mucopiocele. For example, you can see here there is a sinus mucosil here, resulting in expansion of the sinus and it's bulging into the orbital cavity and it's resulting in process of the right orbit. Inverted papilloma, it's a neoplastic nasal epithelium inverts and grows into the underlying mucosa. Not believed to be associated with allergy or chronic infection because they are almost invariably unilateral in location. Occurs exclusively in the lateral nasal wall centered in the hiatus semilunaris, associated with increased incidence of squamous cell carcinoma. So they should be removed. Juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, it's another uh, entity affecting the sinuses. It occurs uh, mostly in uh, male adolescents presenting with epistaxis and arise from the vas fibrovascular stroma of the nasal wall. Adjacent to the sphenopalatine foramen, that's its characteristic location, and the tumor usually fills the nasopharynx and moves the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus forward. And typically, the retromaxillary pterygopalatine fossa location is the hallmark. Uh, since it's markedly vascular with marked uh, with recurrent epistaxis, it enhances avidly post contrast. And here, uh, for the removal, interventional uh, procedures are used to embolize the tumor in order to minimize the blood loss during surgical uh, resection. Malignancies of the paranasal sinuses include the squamous cell carcinoma, which is most common, about up to 90%, and the squamous cell carcinoma usually is clinically silent until it's quite advanced. Another patho uh, malignant pathology is enthesoneuroblastoma, which is a tumor rises for, uh, arises from the neurosensory receptor cells of the olfactory nerve. Since uh, it's arising from the olfactory nerve and the olfactory mucosa, it will most commonly involve the cryptiform plate extending into the anterior cranial fossa. Uh, and so, so involvement of the nasal cavity and the anterior cranial fossa should suggest the diagnosis. For example, you can see in this case, uh, there is a mass lesion that is extending into the through the cribriform plate that is almost destructed and could not be identified accurately and extends into the anterior cranial fossa and with its heterogeneous enhancement, and suggesting the possibility of enthesial neuroblastoma. Another compartment of the head and neck is the skull base, which extends from the nose anteriorly to the occipital protuberance posteriorly. It's composed of five bones, the ethmoid, sphenoid, occipital, temporal, and frontal bones. The tumors that affect the skull base are uh, most commonly, the malignant lesions are most commonly metastatic in nature, while the primary malignancy are rare, only about 2-3%. to and most common uh, primary tumors are chordoma, chondrosarcoma, osteo osteosarcoma. The chordoma, it's a bonioplasm, rises from the remnant of the primitive notochord. It's clini clinically presented as a destructive midline mass center at the clivus. It's typically midline. About 35% will be in the clivus and 50% in the sacrum, 15% in the vertebral body. So it's most common in the sacrum, and the second most common location is the clivus. While chondrosarcoma, it's developed from cartilage, usually in paracellular locations. So it's a paramedia, not in the midline. That's the thing that differentiated it from the, chondro, uh, from the chordoma. Osteosarcoma arises from the previous exposure to radiation, and the skull base likely, uh, the skull base, like any other bone, may be affected by metastasis, myeloma, plasmocytoma, fibrous dysplasia, apagic disease, and uh, other pathologies. Now, another component of the head and neck is the temporal bone. Temporal bone. Uh, the most common pathology includes cholesteatoma. Cholesteatoma, in fact, is an epidermoid cyst. Only 2% are congenital. The vast majority are acquired. The diagnosis based on the detection of soft tissue mass in the middle ear cavity associated bony erosions. This is the most common uh, 
the most important uh, finding is the bony erosion. The superior portion of the tympanic membrane, which is called pars placida, retracts easily, and it's the commonest site for formation of acquired cholesteatoma. So, if we find a soft tissue mass in the pusac space with subtle erosion of the scutum or med a medial displacement of the ossicles, it's characteristic of cholesteatoma. Most diagnosed uh, auto, uh, most of them diagnosed otoscopically, but CT is, has an important role in determining the size of the lesion as well as the status of the ossicles. So they, because this cannot be diagnosed otoscopically. Uh, also, uh, the, the status of the labyrinth, the tigment, and the facial nerve. Uh, Cholesteatoma has a restricted diffusion uh, on diffusion weighted imaging. Another pathology of the uh, temporal bone is cholesterol granuloma. Cholesterol granuloma, known as the giant cholesterol cyst, type of granulation tissue that may involve the petrous apex because of the hemorrhage in the lesion. So it will be characterized by an increased signal intensity on both T1 and T2 weighted images. The deep anatomy of the head and neck is subdivided by layers of deep fascia into seven compartments, seven spaces. So if we know these spaces, we, it will help us to narrow our differential diagnosis because each space has only a limited number of pathologies that can affect this particular space. For example, you can see here, this is what's called the parotid space, and this is called the masticator space. Uh, the uh, buccal uh, space is this one, and this is the parapharyngeal space, okay? The blue one is the prevertebral and perivertebral space. Pharyngeal mucosal space is here, okay? So, we will talk about these spaces one by one and what are the pathologies that might affect each space. First, the superficial mucosal space, it includes all the structures of the airway side of the pharyngobasilar fascia. The principal constituent of this space is a mucosa, which consists of squamous epithelium, submucosal lymphatics, hundreds of minor salivary glands. Squamous cell carcinoma, lymphoma, minor salivary gland malignancies are seen in this space, and usually we see a triad of radiographic findings consisting of superficial nasopharyngeal mucosal asymmetry with epsilateral nasopharyngeal adenopathy and mastoid air cells opacification. For example, you can see here there's a case of squamous cell carcinoma, and there is obviously a mucosal asymmetry, and on other images not shown here, there was a lymphadenopathy, and if we look carefully, there is some mucosal opacification of these mastoid air cells. This is due to the, uh, this lesion obstructing the ostachian tube at the fossa of Rosenmiller, resulting in, uh, in dysfunction of the ostachian tube. Regarding uh, uh, nasopharyngeal malignancies, also uh, another image showing a mass here at the fossa of Rosenmiller involving the, the mucosal space and resulting in complete opacification of the mastoid air cells with some lymph nodes here. These are characteristic findings of malignant nasopharyngeal neoplasm. Another space is the parapharyngeal space. Parapharyngeal space is a triangular fat filled compartment extending from the scalp base to the submandibular gland region. This space is very important not because of its content. It uh, contains primarily fat and the pathologies within it are relatively rare. But its importance lies in that it is a space between other spaces. So the displacement or the mass effect from pathologies arising from other spaces will affect this space. So if it is displaced in one direction, it can help us to decide which space the pathology is arising from. So that uh, uh, we should know its relation to the other spaces. The parapharyngeal space is surrounded by the carotid space posteriorly. So lesion in the carotid space will displace it anteriorly. The parotid space laterally, so it will displace it medially. The masticator space anteriorly, so the lesion in the masticator space will displace it posteriorly. And the superficial mucosal space medially. For example, we can see here there is a lesion arising from the deep part of the parotid gland and is bulging medially into the uh, parapharyngeal space. So we can see the parapharyngeal space here. This is the normal side and this is the abnormal side. Since it's displaced medially, this suggests that the lesion is arising from the parotid space, which is located laterally. Uh, in order to be sure that this is lesion arising from the parotid gland, the stylomandibular area or foramen here is widened. This is typical feature in 
parotid malignant, uh, parotid neoplasm, sorry. Uh, if it's narrowed, this will indicate possibly uh, another pathology. We'll talk about it later. The carotid space, masses in the carotid space deviates the pharyngeal space anteriorly, as we said, uh, and will separate or anteriorly displace the carotid and jugular vein, which narrows the stabulomandibular notch. So this helps us to differentiate between masses arising from the parotid space or carotid space. This is a characteristic feature distinguishing these lesions from the parotid space lesion, as we said. So tumors in the carotid space, the, uh, most of them are benign. That arise from nerves located within the carotid sheath. The most common lesions are paraganglioma, also called chemodectomas, and nerve sheath tumors like schwannoma and neurofibroma. The paraganglioma are vascular tumors arising from neural crest derivatives, crest cell derivatives. These lesions are named according to the nerve from which they arise from. For example, if they arise from the carotid body, they are uh, at the carotid bifurcation, they are called carotid body tumors. If they arise from the vagus nerve, they, called, they are called glomus vagali. If they are, arise from the uh, jugular ganglion of the vagus nerve, they are called glomus jugulari. If it is around the Arnold and Jacobson nerve in the middle ear called glomus tympanicum. So basically they are all the same. The difference in the, uh, is only from where they arise. So different names means different locations. Despite the use of different names, the imaging features and the histology are all the same. Paragangliomas are often multiple, up to 10%, and in familial cases, they are multiple in 25 to 33% of the time. So if we detect a lesion, we should look for others. Within the carotid space, if it's arising from the carotid body, uh, it will result in displacement or separation from the, of the internal and external carotid arteries from each other. It will show a strong blush in the capillary phase, and the treatment consists of surgical resection with possible pre-surgical embolization because they are vascular tumors. For example, we can see here there is a mass lesion here in the carotid space, and this places the pharyng uh, parapharyngeal space anteriorly, and it results in separation of the carotid arteries from each other, and the mass is enhanced avidly on uh, post-contrast images and with conventional angiography. We can see the displacement obviously here, and in this uh, free gear reconstruction, you can see the uh, common and uh, the internal and external carotid arteries separate from each other. Characteristic of a carotid body tumor. Again, here there is a, a case of glomus jugulari tumor. We can see here there is a tumor at the jugular foramen, this heterogeneous mass with salt and pepper appearance due to the vascularity of the lesion, and it appears to be enhanced avidly after contrast. Also, due to the mass effect results, and the effect it will affect the hypoglossal nerve, causing atrophy of the ipsilateral side of the tongue. Schwannoma is another uh, carotid uh, she, uh, space tumor, and here it is enhancing everything because it's a vascular tumor. However, it enhances homogeneously. There is no salt and pepper appearance. Regarding the parotid space, masses arising from the deep lobe of the parotid gland will deviate the parapharyngeal space medially, as we saw previously, and will cause widening of the stylomastoid foramen. And the structures within the parotid space that may give rise to pathology include parotid gland and lymph nodes. Regarding parotid gland, the parotid tumors, most of the tumors affecting them are affected here is benign, about 80%. Most of them are pleomorphic adenomas, and the second most common benign salivary gland tumor is the Worthen tumor. While malignant tumors that account for about 20% of the parotid lesions include adenocystic uh, carcinoma, uh, adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and the mucoepidermoid carcinoma. CT and MRI not differentiate benign from magnet lesions, so histopathology will be of paramount importance here. The presence of multiple lesions within the parotid space may be seen with several conditions, including inflammatory or malignant adenopathy. Another possibility is warting tumor, which is multiple in 10% of the time and more common in men. We can see here there are multiple intraparotid lymph nodes. Intraparotid lymph nodes are a normal finding, however, here because they are multiple, they are rounded, they are of, uh, showing loss of normal signal intensity, and they are large, it should suggest malignant involvement, which is, in this case was a retroauricular scalp angiosarcoma. 
This is a case of teleomorphic adenoma. It's a benign pathology, and you can see a very well-defined lesion within the parotid gland that is uh, iso to hypo intense on T1 and hyper intense on T2, and it's showing heterogeneous post-contrast enhancement. The next space is the masticator space. The masticator space is formed by a superficial layer of deep cervical fascia surrounding the muscles of the mastication and the mandible. It extends from the angle of the mandible superiorly to the skull base and over the temporalis muscle. The muscles of mastication include the temporalis, medial and lateral trigoids, and mass and masseters. In addition, branches of the trigeminal nerve, internal maxillary artery are located within this space, and masses of the masticator space this places the pharyngeal space medially and posteriorly. Most common masses of this space are infectious in origin, usually from dental caries, dental extractions. Primary malignancies are very uncommon, usually uh, due to extension of the oropharyngeal or tongue-based squamous cell carcinoma to involve muscles of mastication. For example, we can see here there is a, this is a case of mucormycosis infection seen involving the masticator space here and it extends on the perineurally along the trigeminal nerve, branches of the trigeminal nerve intracranially, and it extends posteriorly into the brain stem. You can see it here and here. Regarding the retropharyngeal space, retropharyngeal space it's a potential space. It lies posterior to the superficial mucosa. So, uh, it's a uh, uh, potential space that lies posterior to the superficial, posterior to the superficial and mucosal space and pharyngeal constrictor muscles anterior to the prevertebral space. So, it's the space between the pharyngeal mucosa and the prevertebral space. It's not related to the prevertebral space. A mass within this space will result in characteristic posterior displacement of the prevertebral muscles. It will displace the prevertebral muscles posteriorly as opposed to the prevertebral space that we will talk about it in a while. This space is significant because it serves a potential conduit for the spread of tumor or infection from the pharynx to the mediastinum. So any pathology here will result in downward extension to the mediastinum. And in contrast to the carotid and parotid spaces in any inflammatory disease or metastasis uh, in which the inflammatory disease and metastasis account for minority of lesions, the retropharyngeal space mostly affected by infection or nodal malignancy. The, uh, the retropharyngeal space is most often involved in nodal malignancy because the lymphoma or metastatic head and neck squamous cell carcinoma will affect these lymph nodes. So these tumors will affect the retropharyngeal lymph nodes which are divided into medial and lateral groups. The lateral retropharyngeal nodes, also known as nodes of Rovier, are normal when seen in younger patients. So if you see them, the lateral retropharyngeal lymph nodes in young patients, these are normal. But if seen in patients older than 30 years, they should be suspicious. In addition, the head and neck infection may sometimes extend to the retropharyngeal space via lymphatics. Because the retropharyngeal space may serve as a conduit, spreading infection into the mediastinum, this space also being known as the danger space, because the disease there will extend into the thoracic cavity and not will, be, will not be localized into the parapharyngeal space. For example, you can see here this is a parapharyngeal, uh, 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 retropharyngeal abscess, sorry. There is, this is the larynx and this is the prevertebral space. The space between them here is fluid collection, which is the abscess, displacing the prevertebral muscles posteriorly. And when you go downward, it is extended into the mediastinum to the thoracic cavity. Regarding the prevertebral space, it's formed by the prevertebral fascia which surrounds the prevertebral muscles. So the masses will displace the prevertebral muscles anteriorly, as opposed to the retropharyngeal space, will, will, masses will displace the prevertebral muscles posteriorly. So this will allow us to differentiate the origin of the masses in this area. So the structures that are result that our most common pathologies in this space are cervical vertebral uh, bodies. Uh, any, abs uh, any process that involves the vertebral bodies, such as tumors like metastasis, chordoma, etc., osteomyelitis, may extend anteriorly to involve this space. Regarding the lymph nodes of the head and neck, once a primary neoplasm of the head and neck is detected, the lymph node will 
be very important to be looked for because the presence of a single single just one epsilateral malignant node will reduce the patient expected survival by 50 percent if there is extra capsular nodal extension will reduce the survival by additional 25 percent so the detection of the nodal disease is critical in both and uh, for both prognosis and for therapy we can use both ct and mri in addition to, it to play a vital role in the staging of the head and neck neoplasm because Clinically, it's difficult to determine the full size of the primary neoplasm and its associated extension. Now, an important thing to be remembered that if an enlarged lymph node encountered on CT or MRI, it can be benign, reactive lymph node, or a malignant lymph node, and the differentiation can be very difficult. The features that are in favor of malignancy are peripheral nodal enhancement, central necrosis, extracapular uh, spread of the infiltration uh, of the disease and infiltration of the adjacent tissues, and if there, is a, there are matted conglomerate masses of nodes. The main criteria that we use radiologically to decide whether this lymph node is a benign or malignant one is the nodal size. But it is not a reliable indicator of malignancy because the, about 70% of enlarged nodes are secondary to metastasis, and up to 30% are caused by benign reactive hyperplasia. So, the malignancy and uh, infection involving the lymph nodes result in the same uh, morphological changes, and the two cannot be differentiated by imaging. However, the, this distinction is often easily uh, clinically. PET CT plays a vital role in the staging because it can show us that this lymph node is malignant or not. Uh, malignant, uh, malignant lymph nodes can have a normal size on CT and MRI. Uh, but appear malignant if they are hot on PET CT. And the converse is true. A large lymph node might be cold on PET CT, suggesting it's a benign lymph node. So, the main principal lymph node group of the neck is the internal jugular chain, which we will focus on it. It will serve, uh, the jugular nodal chain serve as a common afferent pathway for lymphatic drainage of the entire head and neck. So, this nasal chain follows an oblique course of jugular vein beneath the uh, and adjacent to the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The most superior one is the jugular digastric node, uh, and it's located, at the level, it's located at the level of the hyoid bone, and the jugular digastric lymph node is immediately posterior to the submandibular gland, which will provide the lymphatic drainage for, from the tonsils, from the oral cavity, pharynx, submandibular lymph nodes, it all will go into the jugular digastric lymph node and may normally measure up to 1.5 centimeter in diameter. So if measure 1.5, it's normal regarding size criteria. All other nodes of the head and neck are considered abnormal if larger than one centimeter. So we can see here that this is the jugular digastric lymph node. It's located at the level uh, just posterior, uh, anterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Uh, This is a case of squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue, and it will uh, it shows a mass within the tongue and extends through the lymphatic uh, in lymphatics at the posterior aspect at the base of the tongue into the uh, the contralateral side, associated with enlarged lymph node. This is the jugular digastric lymph node, and this lymph node is showing peripheral thick enhancement with central necrosis, suggesting malignant involvement. Another compartment to be remembered in the head and neck is the orbit. So, first of all, we should know the contents of the orbit and the various orbital spaces so that we can decide which, from which compartment the pathology is arising. The retrobulbal space contains both extra and intraconal spaces. The extraconal spaces are space is located outside the muscles of the uh, uh, the extraocular muscles, the uh, annulus of Zen. These muscles are formed. Uh, these muscles will form a cone, and everything outside these muscles is extraconal. The muscles are the superior, inferior, medial, and lateral lictus, in addition to the superior oblique and levator papillary superiors, and a fibrous septum. All of these structures will form a cone with its base at the posterior of the globe and its apex at the superior orbital fissure. So, when identifying intraconal lesions. It is essential to decide whether the uh, what are defining sorry uh, uh, 
For identifying intraconal lesion, it is essential to decide whether this lesion is arising from the optic nerve sheath complex or it is extrinsic to the optic nerve, but still intraconal. So, regarding uh, the globe, the globe is subdivided into anterior and posterior compart uh, segments by the lens. So, anything anterior to the lens is the anterior compartment or anterior chamber, and posterior to the lens is the posterior chamber. The optic nerve sheath complex contains the optic nerve, the ophthalmic artery, and the central retinal artery and vein surrounding sheath of meninges. It extends into the uh, intracranial meninges. The intraconal space contains orbital fat, can we see, uh, as we see here. It contains the ophthalmic artery and the second, third cranial nerves in addition to the nasociliary nerve and the, four, uh, and the sixth cranial nerve. The myofascial Cone contains the extraocular muscles with the interconnecting fascia. These extraocular uh, muscles are contained within a space called the myofascial plane in addition to the fourth cranial nerve. The extraconal space contains fat, lacrimal gland, and sac in addition to portion of the superior ophthalmic vein, the lacrimal, and the frontal branches of the sixth cranial nerve. Optic nerve glioma is the most common tumor of the optic nerve, typically seen in the first decade of life. There is a high association with NF or neurofibromatosis type 1, particularly when it's a bilateral. Histologically, these are low-grade parasitic astrocytoma. What we see on imaging is that there is enlargement of the optic nerve sheath complex. The enlargement might be tubular, useful, eccentric, kinking. Some optic nerve gliomas have extensive associated thickening of the perioptic meninges. This reflects peritumoral reactive meningeal changes, not a meningioma. It's just peritumoral meningeal reaction, which has been called arachnoid hyperplasia or gliomatosis, uh, commonly seen in patients with neurofibromatosis. We can see here, this is an optic nerve glioma, and we can see there's a fusiform elongated enlargement of the optic nerve itself, not of the meninges. <coughs> Sorry. And we can see... There is uh, uh, this arrowhead represents uh, a large optic nerve uh, with uh, arachnoidal hyperplasia. So this is a case of uh, neurofibromatosis. Regarding optic sheath meningioma, it's a meningioma just like the one we see intracranially, but it's seen in the meninges surrounding the optic nerve. Uh, it has a circular configuration, grows in a linear fashion along the optic nerve. It demonstrates a characteristic tram track pattern of linear contrast enhancement because the nerve sheath is involved and the optic nerve is normal. So, MR can easily display this pathology. In contrast to optic nerve glioma, meningioma may invade and grow through the dura, resulting in irregular asymmetric appearance. May extensively calcify. Additionally, the optic sheath meningioma may. Uh, 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 Excessively calcify while the optic nerve glioma they rarely calcify. For example, we can see here there is this trauma track pattern. You can see the optic nerve inside completely normal and the surrounding meninges are markedly enhanced. It extends intracranially, showing this dural tail sign. Very suggestive of optic nerve meningioma. An important differential diagnostic consideration for enhancement of the optic nerve sheet is optic neuritis. Optic neuritis demonstrates enhancement of the optic nerve sheath. Optic uh, neuritis also demonstrates abnormal T2 hyperintensity and contrast enhancement as a result of inflammation of the optic nerve itself. So the whole optic nerve sheath will be involved. Uh, may cause uh, an acute visual defect, deficit, uh, described as a blurring of vision, can be the first sign for MS. About 20% of patients with MS will present initially with optic neuritis. And patients with isolated optic neuritis, up to 50% of them will eventually be diagnosed as MS. As we can see here, this optic nerve is inflamed, swollen, edematous, and in comparison to the other optic nerve, to the contralateral optic nerve, this is the normal appearing sheath, optic nerve sheath, and this is inflamed suggesting optic neuritis. We should look carefully for other uh, signs of multiple sclerosis. Vascular orbital lesions include capillary hemangiomas, 
usually seen in the first year with the flow voids and infiltrative lesion. Lymphangioma is seen in 3 to 15 years age group. It has blood products, multiple ages. It will be multi-loculated globular mass with heterogeneous signal intensity. Cavernous hemangioma, it's the most common orbital mass in adults. In contrast to other, other vascular lesions of the orbit, hemangioma are characterized as sharply circumscribed rounded mass. Orbital varix can be seen at any age uh, as uh, appears as a dilated vein, may enlarge with valsalva maneuver. It's a vascular structure. Superior ophthalmic vein is well visualized by MR studies and the pathologies affecting it, including thrombosis and enlargement. Thrombosis occurring in conjunction with cavernous sinus thrombosis will present as loss of the normal flow void of the superior ophthalmic vein, and the signal intensity relates to the age of the thrombus. Enlargement of the superior ophthalmic vein may also be seen with cavernous carotid fistula. The cavernous carotid fistula might be due to direct or indirect communication between the internal carotid artery and the cavernous venous sinus. Uh, an interesting pathology to be, uh, to be reviewed uh, in the orbit is an orbital pseudotumor. Uh, it's an idiopathic inflammatory pseudotumor. It's poorly uh, characterized condition that results from an inflammatory lymphocytic infiltrate. This is the most common cause of intraorbital mass lesions in adult population. It's inflammatory pseudotumor. It's rapidly developing, presents with painful processes, chemosis, ophthalmoplegia. On the imaging studies will show both lymphoma and pseudotumor will appear as a diffusely infiltrating lesion capable of involving and extending into the retrobulbar structures. Uh, many reports suggest that T2 dark signal is suggestive of orbital pseudotumor. An important thing to be noticed here, for example, in this case, this is an orbital pseudotumor that appears relatively hypo on T2 weighted images, is that, is that it involves the muscle and extends to involve the insertion of the muscle, the muscular tendinous injunction or the tendinous insertion of the extraocular muscles are involved. This is very important to be noted because this will help us to differentiate it from another pathology that is the thyroid of thermopathy or the Graves disease. Uh, this condition, it's an inflammatory infiltrate, results in inflammatory infiltrate of the orbital muscles and the orbital connective tissue. Typically, it spares the tendinous insertion of the muscle, allowing us to differentiate it from orbital pseudotumors. Can be, uh, clinically and lab findings might suggest hyperthyroidism. 10% will uh, be normal thyroid, uh, will show normal thyroid function. This is called euthyroid ophthalmopathy. This is, uh, uh, as we said, it contrasts to the orbital pseudotumor. It will uh, spares the tendinous insertion. It occurs in a characteristic uh, sequence of muscle involvement uh, that has been uh, uh, shown uh, by the mnemonic I am slow. That's, it usually inf uh, involves first the inferior rectus, the medial rectus, the superior rectus, the lateral rectus muscles in this sequence. 80% of patients have bilateral muscle involvement, but in some cases, the extraocular muscles may be normal and exothalmus will result in increased retrobulbar fat. So it can be unilateral, can be bilateral, can be due, due to increased retrobulbar fat, or can be due to involvement of the uh, extraocular muscles. This is a case of thyroid ophthalmopathy. If you uh, we can see that the extraocular muscles are markedly enlarged with bilateral proptosis, and if we look carefully, we can see that the tendinous insertion is spared, indicating that it is a thyroid ophthalmopathy rather than uh, orbital pseudotumor. Congenital lesions that affects the head and neck, the most common is the thyroglossal duct cysts. It's account for 90% of the congenital neck lesions found in children. It may be seen in adults. Uh, it represents an, an epithelium line tract along which the primordial thyroid gland migrate. The tubular structure originates from the foramen cecum at the base of the tongue. 75% of the thyroglossal duct cysts are in the midline, usually located at or below the level of the hyoid bone, uh, the region of the thyroid membrane. The thyroglossal duct cysts are the most common midline neck mass. Surgery is the treatment, of course. And uh, these lesions tend to recur if incompletely resected. So the differential diagnosis here includes any carotid anterior cervical lymph nodes from both anterior jugular vein, abscess, or obstructed laryngocele. This is a case of a thyroglossal death cyst. We can see it just a cyst 
by CT by MRI, its assist can have some soft tissue component, which usually due to a remnant of the thyroid gland within the cyst. And by the way, malignant degeneration of the thyroid uh, tissue within the cyst can happen. So we should evaluate the soft tissue within the cyst for possible malignant transformation. Breaker, breaker cleft cysts, uh, the structures of the face and neck are formed from the break, break, uh, brachial cleft apparatus. There are six brachial arches. A brachial cleft cyst sinus or fistula may develop if there is failure of cervical sinus or pouch remnant to regress. Although uh, brachial abnormalities can arise from any of the pouches, the majority arise from the second brachial cleft, which will be our main focus. The course of the second brachial, cyst, uh, brach brachial cleft begins at the base of the tonsillar fossa, extends between the internal and external carotid arteries. Thus, the second brachial cleft cysts are typically found along this pathway, anterior to the middle portion of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and lateral to the internal jugular vein at the level of the carotid bifurcation. Usually, clinically, it will present as a painless neck mass, it will can, uh, tend to vary in size over time, and uh, it's enlarging with upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, these uh, cysts are typically identified, readily identified on CT and MRI as a well-circumscribed cystic lesion. There will be wall thickening, thickness, irregularity, enhancement can be related to active or prior infection. The, uh, in MRI, T1 signal of the cyst may be either hypo or hyper intense due to proteinaceous cyst content with simple fluid appearing dark on T1 and the presence of proteinaceous content result in T1 shortening or increased T1 signal intensity. Differential diagnosis will include necrotic nodes, abscess, cystic neural lesions, and from most vessels. For example, here this, this is a case of uh, broken cleft cyst. This is a typical location. It's anterior and deep to the sternomastoid muscle. Uh, and uh, the submandibular gland is displaced anteriorly. Uh, Broker cleft cyst may display high signal on T1 as a result of T1 shortening, as we said, and the differential diagnosis might include cervical lymph nodes, uh, especially in adults. Regarding lymphangiomas, they are congenital malformation of lymphatic channels. These lesions are benign and non encapsulated. Histologically, they are classified as capillary, cavernous, cystic. Any of these histologic types can be found in a given lesion, but if the preponderance for certain type of uh, dictates show uh, dictates show the lesion is classified. Capillary lymphangioma are composed of capillary sized thin walled lymphatic channels. In contrast, the cavernous lymphangioma are com composed of moderately dilated lymphatics with a with a fibrous adventitia. Cystic hygroma may represent enormously dilated lymphatic channels. These are cystic hygroma. This is a case of cystic hygroma representing a, an enormously dilated lymphatic channel, multiple cysts of uh, heterogeneous signal intensity, mainly fluid signal intensity, okay, that extends within the soft tissue of the anterior neck. Usually, these cysts are soft and they are compressible. When we compress it by hand, they uh, tend to change, to change shape. And it's a common uh, abnormality of uh, congenital abnormality. It has a transpatial nature uh, with characteristic uh, that's characteristic for cystic hygroma or another possible differential diagnosis is a lymphangioma. That will be the end of our chapter for this week. Thank you very much and thanks to Dr. Sabah Ghafoor for preparing this uh, presentation. Uh, I hope to see you again next week. Thank you very much.